Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. Today I've got a case for you that my Irish viewers have been requesting for a really long time, but it's not one that I think is very well known internationally. Even being from the UK just across the water, I've heard of the name Mary Boyle, but her story isn't particularly well known over here. To date, her disappearance is the longest running missing child case in the Republic of Ireland since the 18th of March in 1977. She's been missing for coming up to 43 years and investigators are no closer to an answer now than they were in 1977. Mary Boyle was born in Birmingham, England to her Irish parents Charlie and Anne Boyle on the 14th of June 1970. She had an old brother, Patrick, and an identical twin sister, also called Anne. For the sake of this video, when I'm referring to little Anne, Mary's twin sister, I'll call her Anne Junior, otherwise I can foresee it getting a little bit complicated. When the twins were two years old, the family made the decision to move back to County Donegal in Ireland, where both Anne and Charlie were from. Now, as we all know, I am very English, with a very English accent, and my very English accent apparently struggles to get its tongue around some very Irish pronunciations. So whilst I spent all morning online looking up pronunciations of words, I'm sure I'm probably still going to get it wrong, so please do excuse me, no offence meant to any Irish people. I just am not good with words, apparently. <laughs> so Anne and Charlie actually met at a dance in Birmingham, both hailing from the same area of Ireland, running into each other at this dance. They started their family together in England, but Charlie missed Ireland, so they decided to move back over there to raise their children. Anne actually wanted to move to America herself, but Charlie couldn't bear to be so far away from home. So they moved to Kincastler, a small seaside village in the Rosses area of County Donegal in Ireland. It wasn't too far from their family, so they would visit them often. As was the case on 18th of March 1977, with Mary just six years old. The family travelled down to Anne's parents' house in Cashelard near Ballyshannon for St Patrick's Day, as they did every year. Mary's maternal grandparents lived on a rural farm, neighbours half a mile in between, lots of woodland and space to run and play with her siblings and her cousins, which is exactly what she was doing shortly before she disappeared. Whilst the adults were inside the cottage setting up for dinner, the children were all playing outside. Mary runs inside to give her mum a hug and a kiss, saying, Mum, I forgot to kiss you this morning, before rushing back out again to play with her cousins. These would be the last words she'd ever speak to her mother. Whilst this is happening, Mary's uncle and Anne's brother, Jerry Gallagher, is working on the roof of the house. He's borrowed a ladder from a neighbour to do so, and around 3.45pm he heads off on the short walk to the neighbour's house to return this ladder. Depending on which source you read, the neighbour was from 0.2 to 0.5 miles away. Nevertheless, a relatively short walk, maximum 10 minutes away maybe. And Mary decided to follow Uncle Jerry on his journey through the boggy fields to the neighbour's house. But about halfway through the journey, Mary gives up with the walk. A lot of sources state that Jerry told Mary to turn back, but it does seem that she made the decision herself. They reached this big puddle that Mary was just too little to get through without getting soaked. And it was only a five minute walk, if that, back to her grandparents' cottage. But Mary never arrived back there. This was a very quiet area and her uncle had no doubts that Mary knew her way back to the cottage when she started the walk back. And this was the 1970s, children roamed free often and Mary was only minutes away from home. I talk about a lot of vintage cases on my channel where children went missing in the 60s and the 70s and it's very easy to just judge parents and adults by today's standards but it's always important to bear in mind the standards of the time as well. In the 70s the thought of somebody abducting a child was almost unfathomable and children were much more independent than they are nowadays for better or for worse. And therefore, Uncle Jerry thought nothing whatsoever of Mary turning back to walk back to her grandparents' cottage on her own. There was nobody else around, she knew the area, it was her grandparents' house. Why not? When Mary was last seen, she was wearing a lilac coloured cardigan, brown jeans and her black Wellington boots. Her hair was tied up with ribbons and she was eating a packet of crisps. So Jerry reaches the neighbour's house and he remains there for about 30 minutes, having a chat with them before deciding to head back to the cottage. He arrives back around 4.30pm and immediately continues with his work, fixing a stone wall in front of the house. After a while though, Anne looks outside to see all of the children playing, apart from Mary. 
She calls out, has anyone seen Mary? And the children say they haven't seen her for a while. And Anne immediately panics. They were over 60 miles away from their home and Mary didn't know this area as well as she did her own home. The ground was boggy, there was a big lake nearby, she easily could have wandered off and got lost. Jerry immediately sets off back down the path to look for Mary and Anne tells her mother to light a candle while she shakes holy water all over the place, straight away turning to religion to help her through what would turn out to be a very difficult time. Anne then herself heads out to look for Mary. A couple of men were out fishing on a boat on a nearby lake, pretty close to the cottage, and one of these men was PJ Coughlin. He says that he could hear the whole family out, shouting, Mary, Mary. Jerry approaches these men at first, upset, and shouts across, asking if they'd seen a little girl anywhere. They reply that, no, they haven't. Not long after that, they see Anne Boyle as well, working her way across the bog, clearly frantic with worry. By this point, it was beginning to get dark. There wasn't long left of daylight. PJ, the man from the lake, approaches Anne and asks if she would like him to drive the five miles to Ballyshannon to report Mary as missing to the police, or the Gardai, as they would have been called in Ireland. This would have been pretty much the only option around this time. Many houses in this area still didn't have access to a landline phone. So this is what PJ does, he drives to Ballyshannon. There was a lot of panic happening. There was a child missing on the mountain with boggy ground and a lake and the sun was about to go down and they only had a little bit of daylight left. So it was really important that Mary was found ASAP. And as we all know, the first hour of any missing child search is always considered to be the most important. But precious time had already been lost in this investigation. Not at the fault of the family, of course, but it was a while before they even realised she was missing. And then their first thought is to search for her themselves. She's just wandered off somewhere, she just got lost, of course. And then they can't call the police. Someone has to drive into town and alert the police and the police have to drive to Cachalard themselves. The police investigation doesn't get underway until after 6 p.m. The sun's already pretty much set and it started to rain heavily. The local army are told of the disappearance and soldiers are ordered to join in on the search. People had flashlights, but it was a very difficult search. The army had to let off flares in the sky to temporarily light the area and help people see. The family, police, army and neighbours all trawled through the bogs, calling Mary's name and looking for any trace of her. In the town of Ballyshannon, the annual drama festival was actually taking place and soon after PJ arrived at the station to report Mary as missing, an appeal for volunteers was read from the stage of the festival, asking anyone to come and help the search. And many people did. But it didn't really occur to anyone at this early point that this was anything more than a child wandering off and getting lost. They were looking for a cold, wet little girl, nothing more sinister than that. But they found no trace of Mary, not even a stray Wellington boot or ribbon. They search through the night and have no luck whatsoever, covering almost every inch of ground. Helicopters join in, searching the area by sky that had already been searched by foot. By the morning, Mary's disappearance is national news. Everyone in the country knew to look for a lost little girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. But by the end of the first week, it became clear that they weren't dealing with a little girl who had just wandered off. There was no sign of her and it was as if she had just vanished, as if somebody had just grabbed her off the path. By the end of the first week, the guard I bring in specialist divers to go into the lake at Upper Cashlard behind Mary's grandparents' cottage, the same lake the men were fishing on when Mary disappeared. Now this was just a lake. It wasn't like there was a strong current that would sort of take anybody away. It was just a fairly deep lake. If Mary had happened to wander into it and drown, the likelihood would be that her body would be found very close to the shore in the water. But this was pretty much the only explanation they had for her disappearance at this point. It was the only thing, the only place they hadn't searched. But the divers find nothing. Later on in the investigation, the entire lake was actually drained and the underground caves were cleared. But this did not prove to be fruitful at all. They used mechanical diggers to dig out the soft boggy earth around the area. Maybe she'd been swallowed by the soft soil. But nope, there was just no sign of her. And it was baffling to everyone. Where could have Mary gone? 
The area was scoured intensely and there was just no sign of her. By the end of the first week, the police were no closer to any clues than they were at the end of the first day. And the newspapers were already reporting that they were unlikely to find Mary alive. Over the next six weeks, the investigation continues, but there's only so many times the same area can be searched. Honestly, I couldn't find loads of information about the investigation past that first week. I can't really tell you what avenues the police went down in the following weeks. I assume they questioned the locals, I assume they questioned the family and they got a timeline in place. I assume they followed up on any potential leads, but that's all just guesses on my part, just the way any normal investigation should go. I do know that they created a reconstruction of Mary's disappearance using her identical twin sister, Anne Junior. A detective took Anne Junior on a walk, the same route that Mary would have taken with her Uncle Jerry that day. Then the detective feigned forgetting something at the cottage. He asked Anne Junior if she would turn back and get it for him. Along this route, many other police officers hid in the bushes, watching Anne Junior's every move on her journey back. They were identical twins, Anne and Mary. They looked exactly the same, and they had an incredibly close bond. They had all of the cliches of finishing each other's sentences and knowing what the other one was thinking. And I think the police thought that by asking Anne to do a very similar thing to Mary, head back to the cottage from the same point, then maybe Anne Junior would do exactly the same thing that Mary did. Maybe even inadvertently lead them to her. It was a very long shot, of course, but in an investigation that has nothing, you get pretty desperate. But Anne Junior made it back to the house with no problem, just another dead end. Anne Junior and her brother Patrick are soon sent back to live with other family members at home in Kinsler, whilst Anne and Charlie stayed in Cachelard to continue the search for their daughter. But after six weeks, they have to make the decision to head home. There's nothing more they can do to search for Mary. They had to just continue with life for the sake of their other children and trust that the police were going to continue the investigation. But now, 43 years later, they still don't have the answers. The Boyle family haven't had the easiest time of it over the years. Anne Junior grew up without her twin and rebelled in her teenage years, giving birth to her own daughter, who she named Mary, when she was 17. In Catholic Ireland, a teenage unmarried mother was faced with a lot of criticism. And Charlie, Mary's dad, died in a fishing accident off the coast of Donegal in 2005. Nowadays, Anne Junior and Anne no longer speak. They've fallen out over Mary's case. Anne Junior believes that she knows what may have happened to her sister, and Anne disagrees with her and her way of going about it. Anne, being the mother, is Mary's next of kin, meaning that she has the final say in anything to do with Mary's case. Anne Junior is not. However, Anne Junior is convinced that she knows what happened to her sister. She believes that Mary was abducted and killed by someone known to her, that Mary was being abused and the person responsible for the abuse killed her, possibly because Mary had threatened to tell. The person that she suspects to be responsible hasn't been named publicly for legal reasons, and this same person was apparently the chief suspect during the original 1977 investigation. In 2016, Anne Junior took part in a very controversial documentary named Mary Boyle, The Untold Story, which explored the possibility of this theory along with several others. Made by journalist Gemma O'Doherty, the documentary was posted on YouTube and racked up almost a million views before it was eventually removed. The documentary made claims of political interference in the investigation and it featured interviews with two retired guard sergeants who later denied that any such interference had taken place. But there actually was an Irish politician who ended up suing the filmmaker for defamation even though his name was never actually mentioned in this documentary. Sean McKenniff, a late Fianna Fáil politician, sued them for 75,000 euros. Now he has since passed, he died, but a judge has granted his estate permission to continue this case. The documentary basically claimed that a politician, a higher up, had prevented the Gardai from pursuing a particular chief suspect in Mary's disappearance by making a phone call. Sean McKenniff issued a statement soon after the release of the documentary stating that he couldn't have been the person that had been referred to in this documentary and he denied having any knowledge of the phone call involved. 
As a result of this alleged phone call, the main suspect at the time was not arrested and it's still not really public knowledge who this suspect was. Without much knowledge of Irish politics and politicians myself, I can't really speak for how much the documentary does allude to McKenniff, as I just don't really know the context behind it. For sure, it never actually mentions his name, so it's interesting that he came out with a statement pretty much identifying himself. The former guard who took part in this documentary, basically telling everyone of this phone call, then later said that interviews around this subject were taken out of context and selectively edited. So basically, Anne Junior took part in this very controversial documentary, claiming that she knew it was this chief suspect who had harmed her sister. Anne Junior, along with a distant cousin, country singer Margot O'Donnell, sister of Daniel O'Donnell, have campaigned non-stop for justice for Mary. Margot even released the single, The Missing Mary Boyle, in 2011 to raise funds for a new search of the area in which she disappeared. Whilst this was a private dig in 2011, paid for with funds from the single, the guard I supervised. Apparently it was prompted by a Danish psychic who visited the area and pointed to where the dig should take place. But of course, they found nothing. And Junior wants an inquest into Mary's case. But for an inquest to take place, Mary Boyle will have to be pronounced as illegally dead. Whilst Anne Junior accepts there is a likelihood that her sister did indeed die, murdered at that, Anne says that she cannot accept her daughter to be dead without explicit evidence showing so, as she does not want an inquest. And seeing as Anne is Mary's next of kin, she has the final say in the situation. But Anne Junior still wants answers and she launched legal action against Ireland for their refusal to hold an inquest into Mary's disappearance, stating that Article 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights, the right to a thorough, effective investigation, has been breached. She has said that a delay of 40 years in opening an inquest is an irrational and disproportionate breach of Article 2. But the coroner has said in reply that the inquest would have an adverse effect on Mary's mother and as next of kin, Anne has the final say. Most of the information I could find around this, around the inquest, is dated around 2018, so I'm going to assume things remain pretty similar two years later. There is rumour of Ireland changing their law around inquests, that potentially any close family member could request one, not just the next of kin, but it seems that that's yet to come around. As you can imagine, this has driven a huge wedge between mother Anne and daughter Anne. Anne Boyle has previously said that she believes her daughter made it to a road which links Cachelard with Bleak on the day she disappeared. I think a part of Anne wants to hope that Mary was just taken by a family who just wanted a child, just wanted somebody to love and care for. And I don't blame her for not wanting to give up that thought. It's a much kinder thought than any of the other options. But let's touch on some of those other options. The kindness of which is that maybe Mary did get lost, maybe she wandered off the path she knew and ended up in the lake, which is unlikely because as we know it was searched by divers and drained, but there is a very slim chance they may have missed her. But also the ground in this area was incredibly soft, almost spongy, it was boggy marshland. Could it be possible that Mary just stepped in the wrong spot and sank into the ground, similar to how maybe quicksand works? Maybe she thought something was a shallow puddle but it turned out to be a lot deeper. And Junior says that she believes this is unlikely because Mary was eating a packet of crisps at the time she disappeared and this crisp packet was never found and it would have floated to the top of any water if she did fall into a puddle or lake. And also, I have mentioned they used diggers to dig up a huge amount of land in this area, although not all of it, of course. This is a possibility, of course, and her body actually might be pretty well preserved if she did end up just getting into an accident in the bogs. But not a single search over the last 43 years has turned up anything, any kind of clue in this area. The most likely scenario that seems both the police and the general public stand by is that Mary may have been abducted. Now this is rural Ireland. There wasn't a huge amount of people in this area, nor a huge amount of cars on the road. The chances of somebody intentionally scouring this particular area for a child and happening to come across one is pretty thin, although not impossible, of course. Maybe Mary did wander to a road and just came across a bad person who happened to pick her up. And another theory of mine that I haven't actually seen anywhere is that maybe somebody accidentally hurt her on the road. Maybe she wandered the road and got hit by a car. So the person picks up a body and hides it, never uttering a word to anyone. 
maybe. It came out a number of years later in around 2016 it seems and the fisherman PJ Coughlin who alerted the police that Mary was missing had at the time reported seeing a red Volkswagen Beetle speeding away from the area just 10 minutes before he saw Jerry searching for a missing Mary. He says that he told the police this at the time but years later he realised that he'd never taken note of this possibly because they already had a suspect and this red car didn't fit with their theory. I did also read somewhere though that Anne had a red car herself so it may have actually been Anne's car that they saw speeding away looking for her daughter but I will say that I read that somewhere and can no longer find that source so please take that with a pinch of salt. For a while it was reported that PJ had actually seen Mary in this car, that he saw her being driven away but in the BBC podcast Nobody Recovered he says that this is actually false, he never saw Mary in the car, he just saw it speeding away and says that he knows in his heart that she was in there. Regardless, a car speeding away from the scene around the same time a little girl has gone missing is definitely suspicious. It's probably also important to point out that PJ and his friend were illegally fishing on the lake that day. They weren't allowed to be there. Therefore, they were on high alert. They were looking for any sign of people, guard eye, in the area. So if there was somebody wandering around, they probably would have taken note of that. That also means it's probably unlikely that Mary herself ever approached the lake because they probably would have seen her or that whoever took Mary, if she was taken, was near the lake either. One name that comes up in this case time and time again is that of Robert Black. Robert Black was a Scottish serial killer, a rapist, one of the worst child killers the UK has ever seen. He was convicted of the kidnap, rape, sexual assault and murder of four girls between 5 and 10 in the 80s in the UK. He is one of the main suspects in Mary's disappearance and when a cold case investigation was launched in 2016, he was one of the main avenues that they were looking at. Black worked as a delivery driver delivering commercial posters and this work would have taken him all across the UK, including across to Northern Ireland and occasionally across the border into the Republic of Ireland. The grandparents' cottage in Cashelard was only a few miles away from the Northern Irish border and investigators discovered that Black was a reasonably regular visitor to Donegal and he also had links in Kincastle where the family lived. And it has been proven that Black was indeed in Northern Ireland with work on the day that Mary went missing. And on the day that Mary went missing, his van was apparently identified outside a pub in Annagree, which although is still in the same county as Cashelard, is just under an hour and a half's drive away. A witness later claimed they'd heard crying from the back of this van in the pub car park, but they assumed it was an animal. But there's no actual evidence linking Robert Black to the disappearance of Mary Boyle, it's all just circumstantial. He drove a van and nobody reported seeing a van in the actual area that Mary disappeared from that day. And seeing as there were so few cars around here back then, it's likely that somebody would have noticed something. He claims to have killed 19 children across the continent between 1969 and 1987 but has only been convicted of four, linked to the last one in just 2011 through DNA. I think Robert Black is as good a suspect as any in this case, even if there is no actual evidence of it. Just the fact that he was known to be in the area on the day in question is enough. He died in prison in 2016 though and I'm unsure if he was ever actually questioned over Mary's disappearance. So what's going on nowadays with this investigation? Well, a man was taken in for questioning in October 2014 but was released the following day without charge. Since the whole Sean McKenna scandal, Irish politicians seem to have turned away from the investigation into Mary's disappearance. It seems that they're all worried now that if they show too much attention, they'll be accused of being the next one to have made the mysterious phone call. Anne Junior is still fighting for her inquest, so that could be a development in the case in the near future. And although Mary's case is still known, the media doesn't cover it as much as it used to. It became this tangled web of politics and accusations, family dramas, infighting, focusing on everything else it seems other than just poor Mary. Today the grandparents cottage in Cashelard is nothing like it was in the 70s. It's still hard to find, it's still in the middle of nowhere but it's now abandoned. The windows are gone, the house is overgrown with mould and plants and it's pretty haunting compared to the life that was there in the days before Mary disappeared. The case is still an open investigation with the guards are willing to take on any new tips. I kinda hope that one day somebody on a walk in this area will just happen to come across a bone or some remains, that after all of this maybe she did just fall into a bog and drown. A peaceful death rather than the other much more painful options, more painful for everyone involved. 
I feel for Anne Boyle who still refuses to believe that her baby girl has died. Maybe she's right and I really hope this case is solved before she passes herself. I am really intrigued to know who this main suspect was but of course because of legalities he can't be named or she can't be named. Um, and I'm very intrigued to know why some kind of politician, who we still don't really know who it was, potentially made a phone call getting the police to release this person. There was definitely something dodgy, something higher up going on here. Maybe the person who abducted Mary was pretty high up themselves. That's a very big possibility if politicians are getting involved here. But of course that's all information that comes from a very highly controversial documentary, so can you really believe everything you hear? Probably not. The BBC did an amazing podcast on this case called Nobody Recovered where journalists actually go and interview Anne and Junior, like anyone involved in this case and it really goes into detail. So if you want to know more about this case then I would highly recommend going to listen to Nobody Recovered. I think there's seven episodes in total. It's about two to three hours worth of listening. It's very, very good. Um, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.